right, well, if you have your Bible this morning, let's turn to Philippians, the first chapter. Philippians in chapter 1. And we've been studying along the lines of dealing with the authority of the believer. And so this morning, <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to spend a little time talking about the practical use of this authority. Amen. It's not just enough to know that we do have authority. We need to know how to use it. Amen. And so let's look at Philippians chapter 1 here. Once again, I'll read verse 27 and 28 from the Amplified Bible. It says, only be sure as citizens so to conduct yourselves that your manner of life will be worthy of the good news of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I do come and see you or remain absent, I may hear of, the, of you that you are standing firm, united in spirit and purpose, striving side by side and contending with a with singleness of mind for the faith of the of of the glad tidings or of the gospel so we said this a little bit on last we talked a little bit on this about this last week that there is a lifestyle that you're going to have to live if you plan on walking in the things that god has required for you to live you know christianity is a lifestyle people and it's not a religion it's not something you jump in you jump out of when you get ready it is a way of life it is a choice and a choice has to be made every single morning that you wake up now when you make the choice to live right because we live in a time and a generation where everybody's starting to say a lot of things about how people are living and making excuses, using the Bible to make excuses for a lot of the foolishness that's going on in the world. And the Bible is very clear on, on the topic. If you're going to walk in the power of God, if you're going to walk in the things of God, if you're going to walk in the blessings of God, there is a lifestyle that equals that. Amen. And so verse 28 proves it says, and, and don't for one moment... Don't you for one moment be frightened or intimidated in anything by your opponent and adversary. Well, we know that our opponents and our adversary are not men. The Bible says that we wrestle against, wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the different classifications of demonic activity. Amen. Now notice, when you live right, it puts you in a position for you not to be frightened for a moment because of the adversary. Now, if you're not living right and you're living in agreement with the adversary, you, you may become intimidated. Amen. It says here, for your fearlessness will be a clear sign to them of their impending destruction. It will be evidence that with the work that God done in you through Jesus Christ is superior to the work that Satan did in Adam. Amen. And there would also be a sure sign of your deliverance and salvation, which comes from God. So we're learning that we have authority. And the Bible says that we're not to be intimidated. We're not to be frightened yes. of our adversaries. Amen. As a child of God, we should not be walking around afraid of the devil. Amen. Period. He's defeated. Now, why did he say this? Well, we read on last week. Let's look at that. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 basically tells us why. Verse 13 says, well, verse 12, Give it thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet or able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Verse 13, who has delivered us? Who has already delivered us? Here's why you shouldn't be frightened and intimidated by the devil. Because it says that he's already delivered us from the power, or we can say authority, of darkness. Amen. He's already delivered you from Satan's authority. And not only did he deliver you from Satan's authority, he translated you over into the kingdom of his dear son, or he brought you underneath the authority of the kingdom of God. So I do not, you do not need to be intimidated by the devil when you've already been delivered off from underneath his authority. And you have been placed underneath the governing power of the kingdom of God. 
Well, we also read in Ephesians where it says that because of this, we've been raised up and made to sit together with him in heavenly places. And we know that Jesus sits on the throne in the holies of holies with his father. And if we've been raised up to sit with him, then we sit with him on that throne. And a throne represents what? A position of authority. So here's why I don't need to be afraid. Here's why you don't need to be afraid of the devil because you've been elevated to a position of authority and that position of authority, Ephesians says, is far above all principalities, all powers, all mights, all dominions, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but that one that was just to come also. You've already received that. This is not something you're going to receive. The Bible says he has already made us sit together with him in this place. So you and I, we have this authority. All right. So since we have this authority, we need to use it. God didn't give you all of this authority and power just for you to walk around and look good. He gave it to us to utilize it to make sure that we're governing what's going on in our lives. And once we've mastered the authority of use in our own lives, then we can begin to utilize it to deal with things around us. But if you're not going to get in the habit of using the authority when it comes to your personal life, then it's going to be virtually almost impossible for you to help someone else in their own life because you don't know how to use it for you. All right. So let's look at this, the practical use of this authority. Let's look at James chapter 4. Now, I know that God expects me to use this because Jesus said that I have given you power or authority over all the power, ability of the devil. See, if if you go look at that verse of scripture, use the word power twice there. I've given you power over all of the power of of, of, of the enemy, your adversary. But the first time it uses power there, it's talking about authority. Jesus says, I've given you authority. And then when it talks about Satan's power, it's ability. I've given you authority over all of Satan's ability. So in other words, there's nothing the devil can do that you don't have authority over. Now, he said that to the disciples before the Holy Ghost was in them. Now, what do you think is going on now that the Holy Spirit is in us? So there has to be practical use to this. James chapter 4. And verse 7. Says, submit yourself, therefore, unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, I want you to pay attention here. Because we hear a lot about if I just resist the devil, he'll flee from me. Not if you're not going to submit your way unto the Lord. See, like I said at first, there is a way that we have to live if we're going to walk in the authority. See, if if you you want to live in a place where you're not intimidated, then you're going to have to live in a place where you're submitted. So I have to, first of all, do what? Submit my way unto the Lord. Once that's done, then as I resist the devil, he'll flee. Because Satan recognizes authority. He recognizes it. And he recognizes the, he recognizes, he recognizes the true authority, which is God's authority. He recognizes that. So the Bible here says if I'm going to submit myself, if I'll make the choice to live a submitted life, then I can have the ability to resist Satan and he will flee from me. Or we could say it this way. I have the authority to oppose him and cause him to flee in stark terror. That's what the Bible actually is saying there. But we're going to have to submit our ways to him first. So when I submit, then I'm able to resist. When you submit then you're able to resist. So um, when I was preparing uh, that word resist, uh, I I, I just got an an unction to look it up. So I looked it up. And I found something interesting here that I I, I caught on to what the Holy Spirit was trying to show me. To resist means, first of all, to take a stand. Too many of God's people are wishy-washy when it comes to this life. 
They have no definitive stance. You really can't tell them any different, tell, tell, them, tell any difference between them and the world. When the Bible says that light has no fellowship with darkness, yeah. and the Bible says that we are the salt of the earth or we are the light of the world, then we should not look like darkness. The Bible says that we are supposed to do what? Expose that. So the first thing it says here when I look that word up, it says to take a stand. God's people, if there's ever been a time in the history of this world that we needed for God's people to take a stand, it's today. Everybody and everybody else's agenda is taking a stand but God's people. It is amazing to me how now, and if we're going to take a stand, the stand that we must take must be in agreement with the word of God. And the Bible is not, is, is not confused on truth. The Bible's not confused on issues. You remember when Moses came down the mountain and after they were down there and they had compromised themselves and the Bible says as Moses drew a line in the sand and says everybody on God's side come over here and everybody does not stay where you are? In other words, hey, there's a definitive line. Let's take a stand. That hasn't changed. There is a line in the realm of the spirit and you're either on God's side or you're not. Amen. There is no in between, folks. So it says we have to take a stand. The next thing it says here, to resist means to withstand the force or the effect of anything. There are forces that are coming against us, but we have been equipped with the ability and the authority to withstand it and to resist its effects. It says also, it says to withstand the force or 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 its effects, and it also says to exert a force in opposition. So not only are we supposed to withstand something, we're also being given the ability to exert another force in opposition to what's coming against you and I. You know, you're not just supposed to stand there and be a slapping and punching bag for the devil. He has no right to touch you. You don't belong to him anymore. You're not his child. He does not have the right to put his hands on you. He does not have the right to put his hands on your children. He does not have the right to anything you possess unless you are walking with him. Amen. Then you give him, you give him permission. He doesn't have a right. And the last one it says here <clears throat> for resist. It says something as a coating of protection or the word resist means to have a coating of protection provides to, pro to provide a resistance. So we're going to look at these things. Uh, what does this have to do with practical application of this authority? Well, first of all, taking a stand. Now, there's a story that I want to look at. Look at Second Chronicles. And let's look at this story. And let's get our minds wrapped around this. Because we're going to have to take a stand, people. We no longer live in the day where we can be wishy-washy. The world needs to see that God is who he is and that God still is able to do what he said he can do. And we read the scripture on last week where it says God fills everything everywhere with himself through the body. Well, that means that if he's going to do that, then the body's going to have to stand up and be who God has called for us to be and stop pretending to be someone else. Now, here in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, there's a story here. Two nations have come against Israel. And... Jehoshaphat is the king at the time. And he, he's, he's in a situation here. And if you notice here in, in verse 12, he goes to God for an answer. He didn't rely upon his own in, uh, uh, intellect. He didn't rely upon his advisors. He went to God and he prayed a prayer. Remember I said on last week that all authority starts and ends with the word of God. All true authority. If you do not have the word on it, you don't have the authority on it. So he goes to God because he needs a word here. 
this is a serious situation. You got two nations coming against you. And he prays this in verse 12. Oh, God, will thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that comes against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon you. So it's, the problem is not knowing what to, what to do in the situation in your own self. That's not the issue. The issue isn't the, the people that, that the enemy is coming against you. That's not the issue. The issue is, will you consult with your God? Will you take the time to find out what to do? And Jehoshaphat did that. And God answered him. And God began to tell him what to do. And they obeyed it. Let's look at verse here, 17. Look at this, where are we going? Yeah, verse 17. Here's God's reply. You should not need to fight in this battle. Set yourself, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord. O Je uh, Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Now notice what he's told them to do. He said, set yourself and be still. Take a stand. Take a stand. I know that there are people and things that are coming against you. I know that your opponents and your adversaries look mightier than you. But be still, take a stand, and fear not. I'm with you, is what he said. God said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. I don't care what the enemy is, 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 is portraying that he's going to do. He can't do any of it unless you decide not to take a stand. But if I take the stand in the word of God, if you will make the decision to stand on the word and believe God and resist the devil, then he will flee from you. Why? Because God is always with you. He's with you. So you read the rest of the story. They, they took that stance. And they won. And they didn't even have to fight the battle. We're too quick to want to get in the fight. And God didn't ask you to fight. God says, oh, will you stand? Will you believe me? You never saw Jesus fighting any battles. What did Jesus do? He took a stand and he spoke. Why? Because he knows he has authority. Kings don't fight. They decree. And the declaration that they make is established. Or it goes out and establishes things. You are a king. God don't need you in the, down in the, in the pit wrestling with the devil. Jesus already won that battle. Yes. Now all he needs for you and I to do is what? Take a stand. And maintain what he's already won for you and I. So we're going to have to take a stand, consult with our God, practical use, when you're up against your opponent, don't rely on your intellect. Don't rely on what you know. Don't even rely on what worked last time. That's all right now. Consult your God. Father, what do I do here? How do I approach this now? How do I take authority over this at this point? We're so quick to, to, to shoot from the hip in the name of Jesus, and you may not know how to hit the devil just at that particular moment. But if you rely upon the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, he'll show you right where to apply the force needed to deal with the issue. Wisdom. Also, let's go over to 1 Peter. You know, practical use. 1 Peter chapter 5. Take a stand. Notice what it says here in chapter uh, 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9. Whom resist, the Amplified Bible says, withstand him. How? Firm in your faith against his onslaught. When I make the decision to consult with God, I've made a decision to consult with his word. Because if I'm talking to God, God's going to give me his word. 
And the Bible here says it's that word that gives me the ability to resist. It's the word that's going to give me the ability to, to put whatever the devil is doing down. It is the word that's going to give you the ability to cast him out. It is the word that gives you the ability to walk in this authority. Because without it, what are you going to say? Satan is not going to listen to you. He don't care nothing about you. When the devil look at you, he doesn't really see you. He's, he sees what the work that God has done in you. And then what he's trying to figure out is, do you realize what God has done for you yet? That's true. See, he tests us to see how much do you know. Yeah. And if you know enough about the word of God and you put the word of God on him, he will do exactly the same thing he did when Jesus put the word on him. He will leave you for a season. Because he realized they're not going to go for that. But you're going to have to make the decision to stand fast or to resist him being firm in your faith against his onslaught and determine that you're going to be an unmovable, you're going to be steadfast, unmovable, and you're going to abound in the work of the Lord in your life. Not always waving the white flag, folks. You can't do that. Also, let's look at James. We're just talking about the resistance of the devil, taking a stand. James chapter 1. You can't be wishy-washy in this stance. Can you imagine Jehoshaphat out here and two nations coming against him and he was wishy-washy, didn't take a stand on the word of God, didn't believe God? They would have gotten slaughtered. Because God told them exactly what to do. But what he told them to do didn't make sense in the natural you got two nations, two armies coming up against you, and you're going you gonna to sing? What's that going to do? You want us to stand still? Didn't, don't you mean fight, Lord? Don't you mean sharpen our, our swords and get our, and get our bowmen ready and get our, de our defensive lines uh, built up? Is, isn't that what you mean? No, stand still and trust me. And he had to believe him. Because if you really truly go back and read that story, God didn't tell them to go out there and sing. God told them to stand still and believe me. Jehoshaphat made a decision to sing. Let us, let's, well, hey, we might as well praise God. That's a form of, hey, we believe what you said, so we're going to praise you in this situation, and we're going to come out of here, and guess what happened? The Bible says that the enemy killed themselves. <laughs> didn't make sense in the natural. Don't have to. But it's all about your faith. What will you believe? Now, notice what it says here in James chapter 1, verse 6. It says here, But let him ask in faith, not wavering, for he that wavers is like a sea tossed and driven with the winds, uh, with the winds and, um, uh, and tossed uh, of the sea. Verse 7, for, for let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Notice, if you're not going to take a stance and you're always going to be tossed to and fro between opinions, you are considered double-minded, and you will be unstable in anything that you do. And where you're unstable, you're vulnerable to attacks. Where you're unstable, you won't take authority. Because you will command the devil to leave on Monday, and on Tuesday you'll be bowing to him. You're unstable. This is why God says, stand still, be still, pay attention here, take a definitive stance on this thing. Well, the doctor says that you, you got three weeks left. All right, you got a decision to make. Or are you going to consult your God and his word, or are you going to believe the lie of the devil? Because if you believe that you got three weeks left, then trying to take authority is not going to work for you. 
See, because you're, 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 you're double-minded. But if you're going to consult God and get into the Word, you're going to hear him say, no, 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 no. I've already paid for that. By my stripes, you're healed and made whole. So now I have the word that says that he's already died and paid the price for me to live. So therefore, I can take authority over these three weeks that you're telling me. No, I take authority over that. No, devil, you can't kill me. I'm not going to die. I refuse. I refuse. And I found this wonderful scripture in Romans chapter 8 that I take like a vitamin now. And it asks the question. It says, if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Now answer that. Does he? Yes. yes. It goes on and says, then he that raised Jesus from the dead shall also give life to your mortal body through by his spirit that dwells in you. So I'm not going to die. Matter of fact, I'm going to get better. Amen. Because the Holy Spirit is in me and he's giving life to this mortal body. It's in there, folks. But if you don't know that, you'll become unstable in that uh, evil word, and you may end up losing your life premature because you refuse to take a stance. We're going to have to take a stance. If we're going to resist the devil and cause him to flee, you're going to have to take your stance, and your stance is going to have to be made in the word of God. It's going to have to be made the word of God, folks. Hey, hey, it's, it's, it's that simple. If you're, if you're, you, it's, you can't continue to come to church and hear good sermons. It is too much going on in the world around you. Heck, it's too much going on in your personal life for you to have time to come in here and just hear good sermons. No, you come in here to hear how to take this word, stand on this word, and use this word, and get the victory from this word. Amen. This is what God left this book here for. The devil been trying to get rid of it for years, millenniums, and it has endured. Why? Because this is the authority of the believer. It is in this book. And Satan doesn't want you to know it. There ain't no universities teaching you this. You don't learn this at going down to the latest, to the, to the, uh, to the, uh, the, the latest uh, motivational speaking seminar. And I don't even care how much the world people try to use the principles. Hey, you can try to use these principles all day long, but if you don't have the authority, the one, the, the, the authoritative one on the inside of you, then you still don't have the, the authority to tell the devil to flee. You need the power of God dwelling in you, and the power of God in you is what he would recognize. Because Satan recognizes authority. So we got to take a stand. <clears throat> now, in this taking a stance, now, I'm going to step on some toes right now, but it's okay. Sec, uh, First Peter chapter 2, let's look at this. Because we've been hearing there's a lot going on in the world right now. Hey, people, Satan has taken one of the most powerful messages in the Bible and perverted it. The message of grace. There is absolutely nothing wrong with the grace message. It is a powerful message, and it is true. Amen. But you got demonic-influenced people that have taken the word of God and twisted it, because that's what wickedness is, and twisted it to deceive man. And now you got church people thinking that they can live any kind of way, do anything they want to do, and, and everything's still going to be okay. Now, nah, folks, I'm here to tell you this morning, you're going to have to take a stance. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, here's the stance. Now, I want to read from the Amplified Bible. But you are a chosen generation. You've been chosen. This is your stance. You've been chosen. You are a royal priesthood. 
You are a dedicated nation. God's own purchased special people. That's the position that you've been given. Why? That you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of him who called you out of, the, uh, out of darkness into his marvelous light. You have been given a spe special seating, a special stance. Why? So that through you he can demonstrate to this world who he is. Amen. We got to take a stand. If you weren't in the word of God, well, let me put it this way. People that are unsaved, this is what they see when they look at the church. And it's a shame. When they look at the church, they don't see authority. They don't see power anymore. Because the church looks too much like them. But when they look at us, they should see answers. When they look at us, they should see deliverance. When they look at us, they should see authority. You know, when we're getting dressed this morning, and, and T.D. Jace was preaching, Quantrell has him on when we're getting dressed. And he was talking about the, uh, the uh, soldier that came to Jesus and said that my servant is at home dying. And Jesus said, he asked Jesus to, you know, could, I need for you to take care of this. Could you help him with this? And Jesus told him, yes, I'll come to your house. And the servant says, no, I don't need you to come to my house. You ain't got to come all the way down here. But notice the response he gave him. He says, I am a man of authority. I can tell them to come and tell them to go and they'll and they do what I say. All you need to do, Jesus, what? Speak. In other words, I recognize your authority. I recognize your power. And I like the way T.D. Jakes put it. He didn't, con he, didn't, he, he didn't know nothing about the churches. He ain't knew nothing about the feast. He ain't went to no the the theological school. He wasn't no man uh, of the word. He knew none of that. He was a Roman soldier. A military man who was in the business of, of killing and, and conquering. But he recognized authority and he saw the authority in Jesus. Now, when the world looks at us, what do they see? Do they see the royal priesthood? Do they see a chosen special people? Do they see authority? Verse 10 says, you once were not a people at all, but now you are God's people. Once you were unpented, but now you are pented and have received mercy. Beloved, I implore you as aliens and strangers and exiles in this world. Hey, you are not a citizen of the world anymore. Your citizenship has changed according to this. Because God just called you an alien to this world, a stranger to this world. Uh, uh, you are an exile of this world. And since that's true, abstain from central urges. It didn't say sexual. It says sensual. Amen. Stop allowing what you can see, feel, hear, taste, and touch govern what you do. Abstain from it. Why? These evil desires and passions and of, of the flesh of the lower nature, they wage war against your soul. Let's put it this way. They wage war against your stability, your mind. See, so you can't be stable. You can't take a stance. Why? Because there's a war raging in you. On one hand, you hear the word saying you have authority. On the other hand, you know how you're living. And the two are contradicting one another. On one hand, you know you shouldn't just let the devil come in here and take over your house. But on the other hand, you're saying, well, I kind of let the devil in here. You're going back and forth. See, you can't let what your flesh wants to do dictate your life. You're going to have to let your spirit dictate your life if you want to walk in this authority. It says it wages war against your soul, against that mind. Folks, the battle is over the mind. 
So we're taking a stance here, and we're going to have to make a decision on, on, on living. There is a proper conduct. Remember, we read that over in, 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 in Philippians when we first started. It says, hey, see to it that you live in such a way that, 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 you're, that you're honoring the gospel. Does your life honor the gospel? Do you live in such a way to where whenever the Holy Spirit needs to show up and handle something, he can show up and handle it through you? That's a thought. Is that how you're living? It's how we should be living every day of our life. We ought to always be ready. The Bible says to do the work of an evangelist. Yes. And the work of the evangelist is, the, uh, it, honestly, when you talk about, think about the work of an evangelist, it is a, a work of the miraculous. Always in a position for the Holy Spirit to show up at any given moment and work through you. But if your life is based on sensual living only, there's going to be a conflict. A war is raging. And we don't want that. So we, we, we have to have proper conduct. Uh, look, at, look at Romans chapter 12. I'm just going through some scriptures with you this morning. It's a little Bible study so we can understand there is a practical use. How do we use this? Well, we're going to have to take a stance. You're going to take a stand against your adversary. Notice with, uh, <clears throat> Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, or I beg, I implore, or I, I, I strongly urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Notice, he starts out saying, hey, I'm begging you. I'm strongly encouraging you to present your body. The Amplified Bible says to make a decisive dedication of your physical body, your members. Present them unto God as a living sacrifice. Quit praying. You know, you hear people praying this, prayer, this hearing this stuff, praying this prayer. Oh, Lord, break, I, Lord, I just need for you to break me and, 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 and always talking about being broken. God don't want to break you. You know what? You know what that you know what you're saying? You know, you think this is what that is. You got a horse that's out of control. In order for you to get the horse in control, you got to break that horse's spirit. You got to break the horse down. God, I don't want you broken down. God wants you to willfully submit. Amen. God's not trying to break you. He says, you present. It's a choice. God don't need, he is not that kind of a father where he's going to break you down. If you're praying a prayer like that, or you're allowing people to pray like that over you, what you're doing is you're licensing the kingdom of darkness to go to work in your life. Because they're the only people that's breaking stuff. God is building up. God is multiplying and adding too. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I don't want to be broken. I want to be the one that says, Lord, here I am. I'm submitted. I'm presenting my life to you. You've been so good unto me. You died for me when I didn't deserve it. You gave me a seat when I didn't deserve a seat. You're so loving, so kind, and so gracious unto me. The least I can do is present my life back to you as an act of my worship. And when you present your life, then it says here, verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. The Amplified Bible says, I think the Amplified Bible says, stop adapting to and copying the behavior patterns of the world. The church, we look, the church looks too much like darkness. And for some reason, that lie got in here to where if we're going to win them, we got we to gotta act like, we got we to gotta assimilate so we can get out there among them and win them. Tell me one time in the Bible where Jesus, and the Bible says Jesus, hey, Jesus sat with the best of the sinners. 
but he did not succumb to any of the sin that they were in. Folks, you are designed to pull them up. They should not be pulling you down. And if you are succumbing to them, then that means they have usurped authority over you. Stop copying the behavior patterns of the world. It's not okay. It's not okay. It's not. It's not okay to do something the Bible said you shouldn't do. You got you got preachers. Preachers talking about when well, we, we smoke a little weed and, and do a little drug before we go out to preach, it helps us revelate better. That's not okay. That's the world. That's what rappers do when they go into a studio to make a record. That's what they're doing. How did they get in the church? What revelation are you getting? It sure ain't the revelation from God. That's not okay. It's not okay to be sleeping with somebody that's not your spouse. That's not okay. I know that's what the world has accepted it, but it's not okay. It's not okay. The Bible speaks against it. We're talking about a stance. What is your stance? Well, maybe I can get them saved. No, you're not. How are you going to get the man or get the woman saved and y'all shacking and y'all sleeping together? You ain't going to get them saved. Trust me, they ain't getting saved. Why? They're enjoying the benefits of the of 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 the of, of the life without without something. Hey, how am I gonna get you saved and I got everything and you give me everything that I want without any requirements? You want to get them saved? You tell them, look here, I love you, but the Bible said this is wrong. This is the last day, but you gotta go. Well, what do you mean I gotta go? You gotta go. I'm taking a stand today. Whose report are you gonna believe? Who's right? Either you right or God's right. Well, I'm going to lose out. You, ain't, you don't have anything to lose. Thank you. I don't know why I'm going to be talking about this, but you don't have anything to lose. <laughs> You're already losing out. Yes. You're being robbed every single day of your life in that situation. Yes. You're being robbed of true love because yes. if the brother or the sister really loved you, they wouldn't put you in that position in the first place. You've been robbed of the peace of God. You've been robbed of benefits that belong to you. You've been robbed. You lose it every single day. And so what if the, if the, if the, if the person decides, but since you don't make this, this if this is the stance you're taking, I'm leaving. Good. Get to stepping. Now I'm free. Now I can use my faith and belief for a true, a true woman or a true husband. Somebody going to love me the right way and love you the way God said you're supposed to be loved and do it right. Yes. And do it right. Take a stand, people. God, is, God loves you so much and he is, con- hey, he, God wants you to have whatever you want more than you want it yourself. But you know, the Bible says sin is a blocker. It's not that God is not doing it. It's being blocked. And it's, 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 that's that double mindedness and you're unstable. You're unstable. And I understand the pressure that comes on you. You arise up and you say, the day is the day. This is it. I, I'm not taking this another day. This is it. The day is the day. And you arise up and the pressure, and before you can actually do it, you, 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 you've lost out. You lost ground. Well, that's when you're going to have to allow on, um, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might and go ahead and take that next step. And hey, folks, it's, it's, it's a lot of times when you have to take authority over things, you have to deal with this, deal with issues in your life. It's frightening because of the unknown. It is frightening. I'm not going to lie to you. But this is why he told Jehoshaphat, fear not, I'm with you. 
Because the devil's going to make it seem like, hey, it's going to be the worst decision you could have ever made. Everything's going to fall apart. It's all going to blow up in your face. And what you need to do is just rear back and say, who cares? I'm going to kill you. Well, glory to God. If I die, then guess what? Absent from the body, I don't have any problems anyway because I'm present with the Lord. So who cares about that either? <laughs> who cares? But if you continue to keep yourself in a position where you're living a life that goes against what the Word of God says, you're unstable and you, your authority isn't working. It's not working. Practical. We just talk about practical use. You cannot live with the devil and put him out. You're either going to put him out or live with him. You're going to have to make a decision. All right. So we got to be, stop copying the behavior patterns of the world and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You're going to have to get this word in your eyes, in your ears, feed on it, feed on it, feed on it, feed on it. And it will strengthen you from the inside. And you'll begin to see like Jehoshaphat begin to see. And you'll begin to praise like Jehoshaphat prays. And you won't care that, it's, that there's two forces coming against you. All you'll begin to see is God. Amen. We was in the kitchen yesterday and Quantrell was talking about something. And she made this statement. She says, I'm starting to get some, I'm starting to get it, uh, of the operation of the, of the use of the word. And she says, because the more, she was saying, the more I meditate in this word, the more I think about this, it's beginning to show me pictures of things. You begin to see a different picture. See, you've been listening to the lies of the devil so long to the only picture you see is the one he show you. There is a different picture. And when you get into the word of God and you start wrapping your mind around what he says and start wrapping your mind around what he thinks and start wrapping your mind around, around what, how he feels about it, a different picture will emerge. Amen. And when you see the new picture, you'll begin to realize, hey, I've been getting robbed all this time. Amen. Devil, you got to get out of here. Amen. No, and you leaving right now because you have a different picture. You don't see yourself as the victim anymore. Remember, we said that we're not fighting from a position of weakness or failure. We are, we, are, we are fighting the good fight of faith from a position of victory. Where are you seated? At the right hand of the Father on the throne with Jesus. You're already elevated. So you're fighting to maintain the victory that you've already received. Quit throwing your victory away. So we have to get our minds renewed that we can prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God for the situation in our, in our lives. Practical use. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5. Taking this stance. Well, that's easy for you to say, Pastor. You got you somebody. <laughs> you know, you hear that all the time. It's easy for you to say because you, you got you somebody. Let me tell you something. How many of you know of or either heard of somebody that had them somebody and still cheating on them? So having somebody don't mean nothing. It's not the having somebody. What it is, is where is your life submitted? My life submitted unto God. When your life is submitted unto God, then you see a different picture. See, you begin to realize it's not about the somebody that I have or don't have. It's about who I'm honoring. Because when you love God, I can be content with or without when I love God. Why? Because I begin to see a different picture. He is my somebody. Amen. And if you just need to have another individual, the person that I'm submitted to will help me. I don't know why I keep getting drugged back to this. I'm trying to get off this. But I hear the Lord saying this too. The reason you can't find the right somebody is because the wrong somebody is blocking. 
Remember, sin's a blocker. God can't send your blessing because there's something they're blocking. I don't know who in here, well, um, Lord, can I get off that? Because I'm trying to get to this. But I just had to say that. All right. Ephesians chapter 5, verse uh, 6. It says, let no one delude or deceive you from the Amplified Bible with empty excuses and groundless arguments for these sins. And it, it gave you a list of them all through here. It says for 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 uh, for uh, through these things are the wrath of God come upon the sons of rebellion and disobedience. Notice, don't you let anyone delude or deceive you. It's a lie. It's a lie. Well, we happy. We doing okay. No, you're not. You've deceived yourself into believing that. You've deceived yourself into believing that if, if, if you don't, whatever it is, that you're not going to be happy. It is a lie. It is sin. God's word is clear on how we are to live. And I hear a lot being taught right now. Well, now you're being legalistic, pastor. You're putting too many rules on us. What are you talking about rules? I'm not putting any rules on you. I thought you were a Christian. Rules, are, the Bible says that rules, laws are for the ungodly. They ain't for you. You have a law written in your heart that's supposed to be dictated how you live. It says it's a lie, folks. And it goes on here, it says here that you need to stop associating with certain stuff. You, verse 8, you once were darkness, but you are now light. Walk and live and conduct yourself as those that are native born to the light. If you're going to walk in this authority, you're going to have to live in this authority. You're going to have to, hey, if you're going to walk in authority, you're going to have to live uh, underneath the authority. Because authority, all authority is is delegated power. You, can't, you don't have authority unless it's been delegated unto you. And the authority that we walk in is God's authority. Now, let me ask you a question. How are you going to walk in his authority and you're not even submitted to it yourself? Can't be done. Can't be done. You're going to have to first submit yourself and then resist. Now, last place here, Titus. I do agree 100% that you do not have to earn the blessings of God. You don't have to earn those. They've been given to you by grace. Absolutely right. You can't earn anything that Jesus has given to you through, through his death, burial, and resurrection. You don't have to earn it. But you do have to live a life that isn't conducive for it to be manifested in, in your life. And this is where people are getting off. Because people are saying, well, you know, you, we don't have to do any works. You're right. I don't have to work to earn anything, but I do have to work on how I live. And you are deceived if you think you don't have to work. The work is lining your life up with this word. Amen. Now, you're going to have to do that. Now, you ain't working to earn nothing from God, but you do have to work to bring your life in line with this word. And I'm fed up with hearing people talking about, well, grace said this and grace said that. Obviously, you don't know what grace said, because if you did, you wouldn't be said, telling me and trying to convince me of what the Bible just says. Don't be deceived by empty, groundless arguments. So you're lying. And you believe in a lie. Notice what it says here. Titus chapter 2. I'm going to read verse 11 and 12 from the Amplified Bible. For the grace of God is... His unmerited favor and spiritual empowerment has come forward and appeared for our deliverance from sin and the eternal salvation of mankind. Notice, what did grace come to do? It came to deliver you from sin. 
not to open the door for you to sin comfortably. Because that's what's going on right now. People try and take the grace message and get comfortable in their sin. Well, it didn't come for you to get comfortable in your sin. It came to deliver you out of there and to show you what what salvation truly looks like. That's what the Bible just said. Verse 12, it. So what is the subject here? What is the it? Grace. Grace has trained us. Grace has trained us. So grace is a trainer. It trains us to reject and renounce all ungodliness, all worldly passionate desires. It trains us to live discreet, temperate, self-controlled, upright, devout, spiritual lives in this present world. Right now, not when you get to heaven, it's training you on how to live and look like God right now. Grace is training you how to operate and function from your seat with Jesus in the heavenly realm. It's teaching you how to walk and live like a king and a priest right now. It's teaching you how to put Satan under your feet right now. It's teaching you how to use the authority of the believer right now. And as you renew your mind to it, and as you allow the grace of God to work in your life and train you and show you a different picture, what you'll begin to realize is you've been being robbed. And when you realize that you have been robbed, you're going to take a stand against the devil and say, no more. You're not coming another step further. You're not getting another thing off of me. You're going to take your hands off my kids. You're going to take your hands off my marriage. You're going to take your hands off my house. You're going to take your hands off my money. No more. Because yes. I realize you're a thief and you've been robbing That's me. Right. That's right. yes. That day will dawn on you. Yes. When you get your mind off of you and get in this in this book. Yeah. Folks, you can't, hey, the authority of the believer will not rise up in you until you realize, first of all, who you are and what you have. That's why it says that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know the hope to which he has called you, yeah. that you may understand what's been invested in you, and that you may understand how exceedingly great this power is that he's given to you to live and operate from. It will dawn on you. Now, you're going to get it through practice. So, so we looked at taking a stance today. We'll, we'll pick it up there on next week. Hopefully, I, 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 I didn't mean to step on everybody's toes this morning, but hey, I see what the Holy Spirit says to say. So, we have authority, folks. We are the governing factor in this earth. Not the politicians. You know, I heard Quantrell say this too. We were talking. She says she, she quoted the scripture. It says, if my people which are called by my name shall honor themselves and pray, seek my face, then, then I will hear from heaven and heal the land. When is the healing of the land going to take place? When we get better politicians? No. Nah. When God's people start seeking his face. You know why? Because then God can speak to us and we can take authority over it. Nah, devil. You putting prayer back in school. The only way he was able to get prayer out of school is why? The church didn't take a stand. Now that they got the Bibles out, they took prayer with it. Now you can't even pray. You ain't praying in school. Got that worked out because the church wouldn't take a stand. Oh, okay. Let's remove the Ten Commandments from all of our government buildings now. Passing those laws too. It's happening. Hmm. Church ain't standing for nothing, huh? Well, let's go ahead and throw a big whammy at them. We're going to legalize gay and lesbian rights and marriages and recognize all, and the church didn't say anything. You know why? Because the church were too busy being divided on the issue. Half of them saying it's right, half of them saying it's wrong. When neither one of us should have mattered, what did the Bible say? The Bible said it's wrong, then we should be united. The only way that they get this stuff done in the world is because the church won't be who she's supposed to be. And the same thing that's going on in the world is the same thing going on in your life if you aren't being who you're supposed to be. Stop blaming the devil for your problems. 
Stop blaming other people for your problems. You're your problem. And when you begin to get your mind wrapped around who God truly says you are, you'll rise up and be who God said you're supposed to be. I have no doubt in my mind. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you this morning for this word. Try to keep it simple and practical. Taking our stance, resisting the devil through a stance in agreement with you and your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that the things that were said in here, that you would take that word cause that word to linger in our hearts and in our minds that it would cause us to take a step up in you and disassociate with all deeds of darkness I pray that you give the strength to each and every one of us to practice the word that we've heard today give us the courage in Jesus name Amen